Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for study through the course of the year every Sabbath morning. This particular lesson is part of a series on the book of James. And this is lesson number nine in that series for November 29 of 2014. And the title is One Lawgiver and Judge. I wonder who that one judge would be. Anyway, we'll find out. So before we begin, as usual, we'd like to offer you or encourage you to bow your heads with us and offer our prayer to guide us through this material. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for all of the revealed record that has been preserved for our benefit and all the scholars down through the generations who have copied and translated and prepared it for our use. Help us now to get into the word in the book of James and to understand it so that it may benefit us in our walk in the Christian life as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to ask ourselves several possibly interrelated questions today. What's the relationship between God's law, our love for God, various human laws, and then our love for other people or our relationship with other human beings. Um, does that, and, and of course, the relationship with other human beings, what does that have to do with our Christianity? What should Christians be doing in a world in the condition which ours is in right now? What kind of relationships should we be developing and should we be demonstrating? Um, have you ever thought that you were sort of above the law? We, we hear about people all the time who are in positions of authority, who think they're above the law. But what about ordinary citizens? Do we ever say, well, I know what's right to do. The law may say I should drive at 55, but, you know, it's, it's perfectly safe for me to drive at 75 or 80. Yeah, I noticed that you, um, you put human laws and God's law kind of together. Um, well, we're, is that, we need to compare them, yes. Is that, a, is that a good way to do it? I mean, um, isn't law kind of a, talking about the character of God? And how well, God's how does, law, yeah. You know, if you have human laws, how, how does that don't, come into character? Don't they describe the character of our government? Y yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so. I don't know. I, it, not really. I mean, the government just spits out those laws. It's not yeah. really a character, is it? Well, it describes what our government is like. Well, uh, is it? I it's, mean, really? We, I mean, well, I mean, that's. I mean, that, they want to be safe, so they make us drive at fifty-five. Yeah. Um, you know, they don't want us to murder anybody, or they'll throw you in jail. Right. Um, that's pretty. Good, and so the average citizen, what he knows about the government <coughs> is the laws that affect him. The laws that are going to affect him? Yeah. That, that's what he knows about the government. Well, but in a country like ours, um, kind of indirectly, uh, we appoint the people that make the laws, and they are elected based upon what they think we want and often what we express we want. So. Yeah. The law, it appears to me, if it uh, reflects the, the nature and the culture uh, of the people, certainly. Yeah. In, in my country, I don't know about, you know, Thailand or someplace like that, but... Uh, so, and so does that work with God's law, too? I mean, does it work that way? I mean... Well, God is not a president, is he? We don't elect him. Well, yeah, you're making a difference here. Mm -hmm. uh, but but we're putting them together here. Um, we've got God's law and human laws, you know, they're kind of well, comparing I, and, them. And that's what we want to try to do is figure out, okay, how are these things different? Are, are human laws by definition always arbitrary and God's laws are not arbitrary? Um, where do we draw these lines? When you say they're arbitrary, that's when, isn't that when you kind of make them up? Yeah. Okay. Right. So does, does God does make those up? Does the 55-mile-an-hour law 
be limits sound a little bit arbitrary. But thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Those all are God's those laws. laws. Did he make those up? He's just describing how things are. Those laws are very different. I think he's describing himself. Don't you think? Well, but he's telling you not to kill. He's not just saying he's not going to kill. Well, I don't know. Isn't, the, isn't, it, isn't it good to point to God and start talking about him? Well, that's what we're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that there are people in both, opposite, both extremes relative to law. There are some people who think that their whole lives are just all about keeping the law, and we call them legalistic, and they're just determined. You know, um, some people have even said things like, you know, I'm going to practice healthy for me even if it kills me. You know, I'm going to do it right the way the law says or else, right? Um, but um, are there other times when we sort of take that attitude? There's the other extreme, of course, of the people who say, you know, doesn't matter what you do, God is going to forgive you. Carry on. Which is the best? Middle of the road. <laughs> Where's the middle of the road? Did someone draw a line down the middle? <laughs> right where I go. <laughs> right, where, right where I am, that's it. Well, what about the law that says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That if certain things that you do, and you're going to get stoned for it. Mm -hmm. but that, that, when that came about, that was a, somewhat of an improvement over a death penalty for relatively minor infractions that they had in Code of Hammurabi and some of those ancient uh, Akkadian well, laws. Well, and let's, let's so not, and, and I agree with you completely, but look at this. Um, look at Joshua 118. Right. Just for a second. Joshua is, Moses has now gone to the top of Mount Nebo, he's disappeared, he's dead. Joshua takes over, and he's trying to stand up, and he's trying to sort of say, take a leadership role. And This is what happens starting with verse 16. They answered Joshua, we will do everything you've told us, and we will go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we always obeyed Moses. And Joshua must have said, oh no. <laughs> And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Now that's fine. Whoever questions your authority or disobeys any of your orders will be put to death. Be determined and confident. Yeah. I mean, and how, how do you communicate to people at that level of, of understanding? I mean, that, that, even a sandbox demonstration is, is, would, wouldn't work. They needed the thunder and lightning from Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. you, because in contrast to the... What he, you can't do the Sermon on Mount for, uh, from Mount Sinai with those kind of people. Mm -hmm. Getting back to an earlier discussion when we first started, when we've got human laws against God's laws, we Christians should know, and I think most of us do most of the time, that God is entitled to put his laws out. It's when we start judging our fellow believers that kind of abrogates God's position, which is what the devil did. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reason for comparing but it, laying it out. There's right? nothing arbitrary about God's law in, if you really analyze things, because that's merely a description of the way things are, will function, not by uh, edict or decree. It's if you're going to live for, uh, for eternity in, in harmony with the Creator, you won't be murdering, you won't be stealing. In fact, you won't even want to do any of those things. You won't even want something that doesn't belong to you. And yet our government, the, the, the basic principle is take from somebody, or under, and then you have penalty of death and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a big difference between the Creator's laws. Right. And this, they didn't get to say, man, how can I control these people? No, I just well, told well, you what, how things work. I got a question. Um, is the law, is it God's law or our law? Which law are you talking about? It's the law. For, it's for our benefit. The law? What law? You're talking about the civil code or you're talking about the criminal code? I'm talking code? about the law that everybody talks about when they're looking at the Old Testament. That's what I'm talking about. Well, is that law, is that law God's it. law or is it our law? It's Which, God's law. God's law. Every, every legitimate law, now let's be honest, you know that the Pharisees in Jesus' day had extracted 
613 laws from the five books of Moses. Now, setting those aside, put, the one, put down the ones that are clearly God's instructions through Moses. And we have to say, if we're, if we're honest, those are God's laws. So the other ones are... The other ones are our laws. Well, ones that basically the what Pharisees... What do you mean by our? They're ours because we made them or God made them for well, us. Somebody, what do you mean by that? It says that, you know, we, God gave us the law. Okay. If God gives us the law, is it our law now? Ah, okay. All right. So now I understand your, what you're meaning by ours. Yeah. I like to put Romans 2.15 in there. Yeah. When those who don't have the law do by nature what the law requires, shows that the law is written on their heart, where they do their thinking. Mm -hmm. and do you have the, an example of somebody like that? Well, yeah. Oh, we can it, make it. The, Ellen White puts it in these words, you know, a very familiar term, I hope, from Christ's Opulence Lessons, page 97. People who are really growing up and mature as Christians will learn to do what is right because it is right. Not because of a promise of a reward or a threat of punishment. No. I don't know. If not even just in. because everybody else is doing it. Right. But do you have an example of somebody pulling that off? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> because the, that's the law, our example. Because he is, he is the epitome of the law. I well, mean, he is the living he, being that fulfills the law. Well, and not only that, he was the living being who made the laws. So the law is Jesus's. Well, and and, but, but prior to, to Adam and Eve's um, shenanigans in, in the Garden of Eden, um, the law, we were in relationship to law, and the law was in a relationship to us just as Jesus was in a relationship to us. Is that right? I mean, to the law. I would about that. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> positive. Okay. <laughs> well, if you go to Mount of Blessing, page 109, I believe if I remember correctly, it just says there that the angels, when God expressed his law to human beings and told Adam, okay, Adam and Eve can do some things, it came to the angel as something unthought of that there was a law. It was just natural for them to do all the right things because they could see. No, that's the right thing to do. So if, I mean, I don't have to worry about a policeman with his radar gun on the highway because I don't, I try not to disobey the laws on the road. So I, I don't, I don't worry about it. Why were they so, so surprised though? That's what I, I Because they, they, they thought, Because whoa. it was there, the law was there, wasn't it? They, they were doing what was right because it was right. It was just, no, the, not just the way they were. Yeah. That's just the way they were. But they were still surprised. If they were doing everything like they were supposed to be doing, then why were they so surprised be that there because was a law? The, for the first time, they, say, they, they, found, they saw God saying, you, you have to do this and this and this. I require you to do this and this and this. They, what? We never heard God talk like that before. But that was probably Isn't in that? contrast with what the, the adversary was, was saying yeah, and, and sure. demonstrating. So it, 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 if there was no adversary, making up the God doesn't have to enunciate yeah. those things well I guess it hasn't worked out very well because right. Paul says that nobody has kept the law and I don't think he even even thinks that there would be anybody that keeps the law outside well, of God okay let's ask this question there's there are lots of verses in the Bible maybe we should look at a couple of them uh, look at Acts 17 verse 11 I have it on the screen there the people in Berea talking about here were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica they listened to the message with great eagerness and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true now what were they doing what were they accomplishing well, that's a they were judging whether what Paul said was correct yeah and what are we supposed to do? You do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because there's a lot of false information out there. There's a devil out there that is doing his level best to deceive us. And a false gospel, mm -hmm. which is a lot of paganism involved in mm -hmm. it. Yep. 
And there's a whole lot of other verses. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Philippians 1, 9, 1 John 4, 1, Galatians 6, 1. I mean, we go on. So how many of us, as, let's say, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, how many of us, if someone stopped us on the street and tell me, said to us, okay, why do you believe da-da-da-da, certain thing that we have, something that we have, why do you believe this? How many of us could open our Bible and say, because it says here and here and here and here? Are we supposed to do that? If we're asked, Paul said, but what about be prepared all the, to... Well, what did Paul meant when he said, <laughs> be prepared to answer anyone who asks you? Yeah, but do you think it's taking the Bible and going like this and this and this? Because Paul didn't have the Bible. I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm just using that as an illustration. We should be able to... We should be able not just to give our information, that's what I'm saying. We should be able to give biblical proof for what we're saying. Back, it up. But, Back up what we've got to say. Okay, that's, that's true, but how would Paul have done it in those days? Well, yeah, the Paul did it by... Memorized. Yeah, Paul did it by memorizing the Old Testament. And that, what about Abraham in his day? Well, he, he, he knew what God had told him in person. In person? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here, and the question now is, how many of us evaluate ourselves honestly? Remember that if your faith is not growing, if your faith is dead, it's no better than an idol. A dead faith is an idol. Do you have an example of a dead faith? I better not get too specific. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. Prosperity, so-called gospel. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. a dead faith is actually having faith in something else other than God. It means a dead faith is is like a lot of, and I'll say a lot of Christians in our day who think that they're on the Christian bus, and the bus is headed for heaven, and they don't have to do a thing except sit there until they arrive. And they can tell you the day they were saved. And probably the hour. Yeah. That's about that's about as far as they've grown. So, so we what have. should they do? Yeah, Study. what should they? Do? <laughs> well, but how how much do they need to know? How much do they? And need how to much strength do they have to have to show that what, so what they can else? get over the line and, what happens, and win? What happens when the bus reaches its destination and there are some people that they just had an opportunity to get on right at the last minute? Yeah, how it's fine. out of their choice. But but it'll be really easy for them. But are no, we, are we they upset? will live in a very difficult time. A but time it, when it will be life-threatening to make those kind of choices. If God is going to honor their choice, then they don't have to know a lot. They don't well, have to know all as, of as this. As an example, it would be the thief on the cross. Okay? Yeah. If, uh, or, or the prodigal son. thief on the cross got on the bus pretty late. Right. Yeah, that's what he's talking so about. That, that shows the graciousness of the Creator God. But he didn't have to know all of these. Well, hold on now. Uh, he, all of all of this okay. stuff. But now, let's 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 um, let's take an example. Some of us are married. We make a commitment. We stand in front of a crowd and we say yes. And when we walk out of the church, do we say, okay, now I don't have to do anything more for this marriage. That's all over. I'm done. I'll just ride along now. Well, as far as being married, no. Mm -hmm. The relationship, yeah. I think you're right. But as far as, as, far as well, being we, hitched together, okay. there's nothing you can, I mean, okay, you can no, get we're not talking. We're not talking about that, that part of the law right now. We're talking about, <laughs> you have a very narrow a very narrow definition of the word marriage. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, now let's get back to our, a little bit more to our lesson. If we see someone within the church doing something that we think is wrong, what should we do? Stop doing that. Get out. I'm going to tell a preacher on you. Zzz. <laughs> <laughs> <No>? <laughs> uh, I guess I <laughs> Unless it's really serious for the in the first instance hold your tongue and observe and certainly yeah. be diplomatic if you say anything. Yeah. No, I gotta Get tell some my backup friend and we're gonna we're gonna do something in the background and Well what if what if a uh, if a person we could talk about what a person might be doing, but what if a person in a position of responsibility 
or authority is teaching lies or misrepresenting God. Is that is that not even worse than a guy uh, uh, in, yeah. in, in society with his peccadillos of life? Yeah, but somebody's got to deal with that somehow. How do they do that? Well, that's what that's I'm asking tough. you. I mean, don't we? Be, I mean, let, let's. The time has come for us to say, okay, the rubber is down here, meeting the road. The devil is out there propagating lies as fast as he can. What do we do about that? There's no end to it on, on the internet no. of, of misinformation about God. I mean, what you could just be, never have to leave home and just be filled with a, bunch, a pack of lies. Well, I guess you can either get out a gun or maybe you can study and make an argument for the other side somehow. Of course, everybody that listens is going to have to make their dis decision yeah. on that. So let's just let's make a couple of points. Is there a difference between the quote laws in the Old Testament and the laws in the New Testament? Should we say, okay, these are lesser important, these are more important? Maybe we ought to make a distinction between the law, capital L-A-W, which would be what we call the Ten Commandment Law, which is even superseded by the law of love. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of them would make those uh, rules, regulations, and statutes. Mm -hmm. And so forth. Where did all the biblical laws, the legitimate, real biblical laws, where did they come from? And what do you, what do you, Jesus what do you, himself. give me any, I need some examples of real, what you're defining as the real well, legitimate. The, okay. In the, in the books of Moses, if you look at, you look through them fairly carefully, you'll discover there's at least five different classifications of, of laws there. There are ones that are just about laws of sanitation, there are laws about how to march. Who's, who goes first, who goes second, da, da, da. There are laws about sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. There, there are laws about how you relate to your, your brothers and sisters, how to get along with the people in the community. And then ultimately, there are what we call the Ten Commandments, the laws that, re laws that relate to God. So, so we're looking at the laws pretty well in the first five books, the ones well, that are... Well, I'm, I'm just giving those as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the law that... Um, well, I mean, and the reason, and let's just, let me be honest. There's a lot of people think that it's all the, those are basically are old stuff, and, and really we don't we shouldn't waste very much time. Those are, maybe kids' stories are good for the old from the Old Testament, but adults we really don't have to mess with the Old Testament. Well, but anymore. there are some of those laws that kind of prescribe what women are supposed to do or not supposed to do, and what men are supposed to do, mm -hmm. and um, we certainly don't subscribe to. Uh, I mean, some of those things in our church. No. And um, why? That's the question. We're trying to decide. Well, because we have placed ourselves above the law and made some decisions. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. So are, the, are are they correct decisions? Well, ultimately. I'm, and why? You know, we, the reason I'm addressing this above the law is because that was a question, you know, kind of leading in here. Yes. And so I'm trying to def kind of go back there and define what that above the law is. Exactly. If we make an interpretation and, and uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Paul, he followed through with those things in the New Testament. He didn't think women ought to speak up in church. They shouldn't be teaching Sabbath school lessons. They shouldn't be up in front presenting the secretary's report. I mean, that's the way it would be interpreted, and, and we don't do that. So have we placed ourselves above the law in making those kinds of Okay, let's be clear about a couple of things first. And I'm, I'm not sure yeah, I'm... I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to yeah. come back to you because I'm dry, not trying to ignore what it. What I'm trying to do is kind of highlight what it means to be above the law. Right. First of all, let's be very clear that every law in the Bible came ultimately from Jesus Christ. The old te He was the leader of the children of Israel from, or the, even, the, let's say, the biblical story from the Garden of Eden to the time he came here on this earth to ultimately. He is the one who has the authority to make laws at every point. Now, if for some reason we call ourselves above the law, we say some laws we no longer do, a very obvious thing that was full of, the Old Test full of in the Old Testament that we don't do anymore is sacrifice animals. Have any of you sacrificed an animal in worship of God? No. Not one of us. Okay. And I don't recall even anything in the New Testament that says not to do that. So, what's happening here? 
Well, some would say we placed ourselves a, <coughs> a good conservative Jewish rabbi would say you have placed yourself above the law. No, well, there's the meaning of the law too, isn't okay. there? So you have to have you're going to have to make a decision on the meaning of the law. Well, then if so I, the meaning when I, of the law could be changed, you know, as far as sacrifice goes, uh, the meaning of the law back then could change at, the, at me, a certain let me, point. Let's use a very specific <laughs> example. I grew up and learned to drive in this country, and the law said you drive on the right. When as soon as I went to work as a doctor, I moved to Zambia in eastern part of Africa, eastern southern Africa, and it's a British, former British colony, and what would have happened if I drove on the right there? Wouldn't the law would have come in and you would have hit somebody. Yeah. So you have to drive on the wrong side. Well, but you see that? <laughs> it's not the well, right but, side. But, but. That's the difference between man's law and God's law. Okay, so, but, so then the next question we have to ask ourselves is, okay, are any of God's laws specific to certain situations which may not be applying to us anymore? I think the, the core of what God wanted to And you grew up driving on the other side of the road. Right, and to this day, wherever I am, I have to be very careful on <laughs> <in> intersections. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Sorry. Uh, what I was going to say is, what was required of the children of Israel, or you might say Old Testament times, and now the core of what gets both sides to heaven has not changed. That's right. The rest of it is, for want of a better term, superfluous. Okay, so now I'm going back to Jay's question. Is there a time when we legitimately can be, I hate to say it, <laughs> above the law? Is that possible? Do we know how ultimately judgment will take place? Well, there's a lot of people who love a verse. It's found in John 5, 22. Look at that for a moment. By John 5, 22, Jesus said, Jesus himself speaking, nor does the Father himself judge anyone. Judgment is gone. I can forget about it. He has given his Son the full right to judge. And man, am I thankful that it's Jesus who's judging me and not the Father, because I know the Father would be really tough on me. Jesus is kind and gentle. We pray to him, the gentle Jesus kind of thing, right? Any, have, anybody have a problem with that? So yep. you're saying that th if there's a change from the God the Father to the Son, that we are now better off. I can show you hundreds and hundreds of preachers and Christians and so forth who absolutely believe that's the gospel truth. Well, if it stayed on God, we haven't really seen the Father, you know, mm -hmm. doing that stuff. So we wonder what he's going to judge. But since we've seen Jesus, which he says, you see him, you see the Father. Mm -hmm. um, now we kind of have an idea how God will judge because it's been given to Jesus. But you said we haven't seen him really do it yet. Yeah, but this is the way that you can see him, right? Because okay, you well, have to, it, you can move it to the Son. Fortunately for us, Jesus also in the book of John gave us a couple of other verses. John chapter 3, starting with verse 17. Let's look at that. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge. Hold on, I thought we just read a verse that said he was the judge. But it goes on here, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged. But those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. Aha! Now we're going to find the answer. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world. Who would that be? Jesus. Jesus Presumably Jesus, as our example. But people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was an obedience to God. So how is the judgment going to take place? The truth will be revealed. The truth will be revealed. Why, it's just a why does it? Why is it revealed? 
Well, because people want to know. I and mean, why is it revealed? Not, not how. Oh. I mean, yeah. well, maybe how it is revealed. It's because Jesus came down here right. to show us the way. To well, change your thinking. Yeah, exactly. Goes on. Look, look at John 12, 47 and 48. More of the same story. If anyone hears my message and does not obey it, I will not judge him. This is Jesus speaking again. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. Aha, now we know who it is. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. So who's going to be our judge? The truth. It's, it's interesting why he had to say it that way. I wonder what, what the problem was that he had to say it that way. Well, let's finish up here. Verse, uh, I like what goes on. For I have not spoken on my own authority. Mm -hmm. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Mm -hmm. You're looking for eternal life? There's another place mm -hmm. where he tells you what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So ultimately we know that the judgment uh, will be carried out. If you like to say it by Jesus, you want to say it by the Father, it will not make any difference at all. What God will ultimately do is simply reveal the truth. And those people who are safe to admit to the kingdom of heaven, those people that God can look inside their characters and he knows it's safe for them to be there, absolutely will be there. The only people who will be excluded from heaven are those that God can't trust to be there. Pretty simple. What is that? Could you uh, take a look at the an interlinear and see what verse 50 says in, in John 12, 50? That word commandment. 12, that, 50? That, yeah, 12, verse 50. Uh, I'll give you the Greek and I'll give you the, this is actually the New American Standard Bible. 50 says, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Uh -huh. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Uh, give me just a second and I'll show you what the Greek says. You know, which particular word? The commandment. His commandment the is commandment. eternal life. His commandment is eternal life. Entoe, that's the usual word for commandment. Okay, could that be law? Well, law is or a teaching? different word. Law is nomos. Right. And law, that refers to usually the whole prin principle. Commandment means a specific command. Here it is, hmm. this particular one. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Well, so we know what was happening in the case of Jesus. Repeatedly, the Pharisees tried to do what as far as law was concerned? Trap him. They wanted to trap him. And so their idea was, we'll use one of these 613 rules that we have made up, and we'll catch Jesus disobeying those rules, and then we will judge him based on the fact that he's not obeying our rules. And how well did that work for them? Well, he was, <laughs> it he was didn't. Pretty, I, pretty slippery. <laughs> he was pretty slippery. Now, these, uh, these laws that were very critical of the Pharisees contriving, and mm -hmm. of course they didn't just cook these up overnight, it was probably many years. Was, was this an attempt, an honest attempt, to kind of help to define, uh, help to understand? Let's use the Sabbath, for example. How do uh, people had questions about the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. And were these not attempts to help to define really what is a, what is a good way to do or, or something like that? Or and they also gave you a good opportunity to condemn people who didn't do what you told them to do, which probably was their main goal. So in their best interpretation, though, these rules were to help the people yeah. to define what they could do on Sabbath, what they could do... Yeah. Uh, to, who is their neighbor? Who is whatever? For people so, wanting to know what is the right thing. To yeah, do. It was their, the Pharisees' interpretation of it, which may or may not have been God's interpretation. Well, they knew that they spoke on behalf of God. I mean, man, yeah. there wasn't any question about that. Well, I wonder if even the law of God can be approached that way. I mean, you, you're sitting there. I mean, we're here saying that the Pharisees were going to help us do everything right, um, is that, is that the, the goal? Is to do well, everything were, right? 
I mean, they're helping us to do well, that. When we get to heaven, when we get to heaven, everybody's going to do right because it is right. We should practice doing that now. Well, there's a lot of stuff I know is right, and I still don't do it. So what's it? What's well? Then what's maybe you need, you need a little more practice. Practice? You're not ready for heaven yet. <laughs> you mean? Maybe you mean I, I got to practice? On the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if practice is going to help, is it? Well, I mean, how do we get to be like Jesus? Maybe pray for His Spirit. Yeah, but it's not just praying. It's not just lying in bed and praying. It's practicing it. Well, you how can do pray, you but then you have to go to out do and do that without strength. I think. What, I mean, I think what Gary. I'm just. I think what Gary is basically saying. It's a question that a lot of people have. It's a question of how good do I have to be? How many? How much goodness? And, and I've started after Gary. So I'm 20 years behind Gary, so he ought to be a whole lot better in goodness with things than, than I am. So what, what is that? Do we have the same equal of goodness? Is, what is, okay. you know? Well, let's think about this. If you're a parent, let's say suppose you have a 2-year-old and you have a, an 18-year-old. Do you expect the same performance from the two of them? No, but then there's Bingo. no... Bingo! Okay. But now you're saying that there is no line to draw to say when we've made it. Well, and you're Gary, saying that no, you, when no, you Gary, get to what? Who's the line for? No, that's my question. You're making my point. You're making my point. There's no what line is there okay, to draw? I mean, if you got if you got children on this side and you got an 18 year old on this side, mm -hmm. well, you're you're starting to approach a better line, I guess, by getting to the 18 year old. But yet, the the child can be saved just like the 18 year old. If there's no you're, line, you're making a mistake there because it, it's not a question of having a line. For the rest of eternity, we will be growing to become more like Jesus. The question is, are we doing that on a day by day day by day basis, or are we not doing it? So, are we actually if we are growing in the Christian life, then God says, that's what I want to see. So what are we practicing then? If he, is, he needs to being, start practicing getting being like Jesus. Better. What, what ruler do you do to make sure that you're growing enough? John well, 17, 3. John 6. Well, but again, don't, don't give me numbers. Tell them. What is it? What, you, what is it? You've got to learn about the Creator God and oh, use that as your ideal. Okay, but, learn more but, about okay you're learning, but my question is, you've got a ruler here, and you're, you're learning every day how fast you have to go up. Do no, you no, go a little bit, or do you question. go a whole bit? That's not the question. That, that's why I said, what line? Well, well this why is the line that I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a line here, and I'm, that's my question. What is the line? Okay. There, there is no let line. Me, let me just, let's just read. I, I don't think you heard what I said. Yeah. If I'm starting on a journey the end of which will be eternity, which means there really isn't any end. What matters? The only thing that matters is, am I on the journey? Am I headed in the right direction? Or am I headed in the opposite direction like the devil wants me to do? Which way am I going? And okay. God can tell which way I'm going. If I'm going in His direction, He says, Hallelujah, welcome home. If I'm headed in the other direction, He can't welcome me home because I would just start the great controversy all over again in heaven. He can't allow that. And it would be hell for you there. Yeah. Well, okay, so you're, you're repeating something that Christians were called, they're called the way. Mm -hmm. So the way is the direction. Ellen White put it this way in talking about this in, in the Review and Herald of 1898. She said, God has committed all judgment under the sun. That's our, one of the verses we read a little bit ago. For without controversy, he is God manifest in the flesh. That is, Jesus himself humanly lived God's purpose, God's life in this, on this earth. Going on, God designed that the prince of sufferers in humanity should be judge of the whole world. He's going to be the judge. He who came from the heavenly courts to save man from eternal death, he whom men despised, rejected, and upon whom they heaped all the contempt of which human beings are inspired by Satan are capable. He who submitted to be arraigned before an earthly tribunal and who suffered the ignominious death of the cross, he alone is to pronounce a sentence of reward or of punishment. He who submitted to the suffering and humiliation of the cross here 
and the counsel of God is to have the fullest compensation and ascend the throne acknowledged by all the heavenly universe as the king of saints. He has undertaken the work of salvation and shown before unfallen worlds and the heavenly family that the work he has begun he is able to complete. Who's watching him as he's judging? The whole, the whole universe. universe. Unfallen worlds and the heavenly family. Okay? It is Christ who gives men the grace of repentance. His merits are accepted by the Father on behalf of every soul that will help to compose the family of God. In that day of final punishment and reward, both saints and sinners will recognize in him who was crucified the judge of all the living. Manuscript 39, 1898, Review and Herald, November 22, 1898. And so why, sort of why does suffering make him judge? Well, okay. I think what he's, he's uh, my understanding of what she's trying to say is, you may think your life is tough. Okay, put your life alongside the life of Jesus and what he put through. Put, you, you're, there's no way you can say, well, I'm sorry, it's just too hard for me to do what God wants me to do. That argument will never float. Okay, since he's gone through the suffering, then he can judge, he can become judge because of the suffering. Well, he, what he's going to say is, I mean, you know, he didn't even condemn the people who were torturing him. He's not going to condemn anybody. He's going to say, here's the law. It's been spelled out for you. How, do you how, how does your life measure up against the truth? Is it safe for us to admit you into the kingdom of heaven, or is it not safe for us to admit you into the kingdom of heaven? That's all he wants to know. And the measure of that is... How, well, much, how much we desire to be like that law. Yeah. Right. Are we becoming, are we growing in our Christianity? That's the, that's the illustration of the blade in the ear and the full corn in the ear and that kind of, that's what that's all about. Now, but won't there be a change in us at the resurrection? Well. Are, we're not always going to have. Not be our plagued with this Be plagued with this, this, Whatever's plaguing us here. You know, <laughs> okay. Our, well, our, what, something about our nature is plaguing yeah. us. What changes at the judgment is our physical makeup, our characteristic, I mean, the, 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 what, what we might call the hardware is going to change. The software doesn't change. The character does not change. We have this time, if, if our character is, is, is working toward becoming more and more like God, and that's our ultimate goal. We're working on, even if we're making tiny little steps, God says, that's good enough for me. Well, usually when I think of the hardware, I think of my physical yeah, body. that's what I'm talking about. And my software, more of my, but, you know, there are temptation. Yeah. Part of it is my body, if, if I have a disposition toward alcoholism. Yes. But, you know, there's other things that don't seem to be have any of that. It's Seems like there's other temptations that come along that don't seem to be affected with all of this. Is what 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 about all of that? Is that I mean, something going to change here that I'm not so? Maybe it's the devil's not going to be around anymore. Maybe that's it. You know, I, I think well the, the practical side of it. Enoch walked and talked with God. We know he's in heaven. Elijah was taken. But Moses you, ultimately got there. He was taken mm -hmm. to heaven after he died so it must be possible yeah but, but how can you how can you be a judge <laughs> and not condemn well and and if you're a really good judge and you're completely fair you will simply lay out the rules and, and that say, isn't condemning? If somebody, if well, you lay out the not, rules not, and not, you know you're breaking it, are, are, isn't the judge condemning? Even, even, the, even, the judge even, is just saying, you broke the law. You, you judged yeah. yourself by breaking the law. The law does the, the law stipulates what yeah. the punishment is. See, if, I, if, you're, if you're, it would appear to me, I'm not a jurist, but if you're, if you're making a proper assessment about a judging, at least in that kind of a setting. But don't you go to a judge to have him make a decision? Well, Isn't that's, that what a judge is for? Well, we but judge. he's supposed to judge based purely on what the law says. That's what he's supposed to be okay, judging. Okay, but if you do something wrong according to the law, 
Mm -hmm. and he reads it out, isn't he condemning them? Well, mm -hmm. not really. It's the law that's condemning them. He's he, just, he's he just is, telling he you. He is mandated yeah, by but the he's law making, himself. He's making the decision, and everybody's going well, by his decision because he's but, the judge. But I just read to you from the scriptures exactly how it works. Jesus said, here's well, I'm my... Questioning it. I'm questioning you to explain that to me because I don't, I don't see how it works. Well... Just read through the Bible and decide whether or not you're obeying what's in there. We're all born self-centered. And those that go to heaven won't have any residual amount of that left in them. When does that change? It's got to start sometime while we're alive and breathing and thinking. It's going to happen before you, before you either you die or before you go to heaven. So if, it, I, if, I, if, I, if I, at the time of judgment and it says, okay, you get to go, then I will have, uh, I'm no longer going to be selfish in any way. That, yeah, but I'd have to agree with that. With so are, you, are you selfish in any way? I probably have many times uh, exhibited some of those things. <laughs> what about <Probably>. now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, those, you know, those are the things I have to wrestle with. And the reason yeah. I'm asking you I'm that a, is I'm because a, I kind of think I'm still that way, <laughs> and I kind of think we're all still that way, and... I'm trying to figure that in with your okay. answer. The well, ultimate example of other centeredness <laughs> was Jesus. We're not tempted above what we're able to, to be told that right there. And when the, the final end of this world comes, we will know one way or another which way we're going to go. Right. Well, James goes in his book. We've wandered fair ways away from James, but we've talked about the <laughs> principles. James goes, he says, now let's talk about some specific examples. Listen to me. Now, you that say today or tomorrow we will travel to a certain city where we will stay a year and go into business and make a lot of money. And where are you reading? I'm reading from James 4, verse 13. And this is the Good News Bible. You don't even know what your life tomorrow will be. You're like a puff of smoke which appears for a moment and then disappears. What you should say is this. If the Lord is willing, we will live and do this or that. But now you're proud and you boast. All such boasting is wrong. So now, in light of that, shouldn't we be getting ready? I mean, if our lives are a puff of smoke? What happens yeah. if I'm getting ready but not there yet and a train hits me? If you're getting ready, the Lord knows that. That's right. He knows that. Now, he goes on and, and he poses a tough problem. He says, well, you should be doing all this stuff. And, and, and remember that the rich people in his day, you needed to be rich, at least moderately rich, because there were no retirement plans, there was no 401ks, there was no government to give you Social Security. What do you do when you get to a place where you can't work anymore? Yeah, the kids work. Well, I mean, well, that's <laughs> one possibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, look at Luke 12. A man in the crowd said, Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. Jesus answered, my, fr my friend, who gave me the right to judge to divide the property between you two? Now, Jesus is not saying, I don't know how to do that. He's obviously capable of being a very good judge. But he's saying, that's not my job right now. You know, imagine if Jesus said, well, okay, I'll, I'll settle that case for you. Pretty soon he would have, had full, he would have been a full time acting as a judge. What about this? What about this? What about this? Please solve our problem. Da, da, da. And so Jesus had to say, no, that's not why I'm here. Then Jesus told them this parable, starting with verse 16, Luke 12, verse 16. There was once a rich man who had land who, which bore good crops. He began to think to himself, I have anywhere to keep all my crops. What can I do? This is what I will do, he told himself. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Now, isn't that a good plan if you're preparing for retirement? Seems like it. Sounds like a good idea, right? There's two sides. We, there's two sides to that. Have you are you putting all your psyche into saving stuff, thinking you're going to live forever? Now, there's good business. That's partly good business. In one hand, it was then, and it is now. Mm -hmm. But you should also be ready to go at the drop of a hat for the hills if you have to. Yeah. Someone has said, plan as if Christ is not coming for years, but live each day as if Christ is coming tomorrow. Can we do that? Is that just a nice 
platitude. And and what what do we mean when we say the Lord willing? Now, I don't hear that so much around here anymore, but <laughs> it's, it's I hear it from some people. Some people. <laughs> I hear it. Yeah. The Lord willing. Why should we be saying that all the time? You skipped over the answer to about my retirement plan. <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay. You've only got to look at the current world scene. It's obvious that sooner or later, probably sooner than we think, we just might have to head for the mountains. Yeah. Gord Gordon, are you still putting stuff into your retirement plan? You bet I am. With drones and GPS, yeah. that's not going to... Well, it depends big. where you are. What, but I mean, I'm, could be an angel guiding you. Who knows? Yeah. Things are going to get a lot rougher than they are now. How, how will you know when you have enough? <laughs> the day I die, I have enough. <laughs> I but the point that Ken was trying to make earlier is you don't just put it into your 401k, you also contribute to the welfare of, of other humans. That's right. you, you're generous, you hopefully. Loving your neighbor. And what's uh, going to happen to every part that you haven't used wisely when Jesus comes? No matter what form of whatever you have it preserved, it's gone. Not going to do another thing, good, for, good or bad. Well, who needs it after that? That's the point. Well, <laughs> well James went on to point out that for Christians, and especially those who believe in the imminent return of Jesus, storing up more and more supplies for the future is a mistake. Look at James 4, verse 14. You don't even know what you, your life tomorrow will be. You're like a puff of smoke. We read that a moment ago, which appears for a moment and then disappears. That's hyperbole. You think so? Well, okay, what? look at a puff of smoke. We're, we live longer than a puff of smoke. I don't care what you say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to see why Luther questioned the book of James. <laughs> so there's some things that are... Okay. Well, here's what Ellen White said. Again, I, li I love what she says because she summarizes things very well in the book Steps to Christ, page 32 and 33. Beware of procrastination. Now she's talking about the puff of smoke idea. Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here is where thousands upon thousands have erred to their eternal loss. See, the devil says, you don't have to do evil. You just have to put off doing good. I will not here dwell upon the shortness and uncertainty of life, she goes on, but there is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yield to the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit and choosing to live in sin for such this delay really is. Sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of infinite loss. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. Steps to Christ, 32, starting paragraph 2. That's pretty scary stuff. Yeah, it's terrifying. Is that good news? Well, Solomon thought more or less the same thing way back in Ecclesiastes. He said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does that mean? That means it's all disappointing. Okay. The quote, wisest man who ever lived. This was his conclusion at the end of his life. Well, look around us. There are just innumerable injustices, cruelties, unfairnesses, and so forth going on. Do we have any responsibility to try to deal with those? Well, I'm not Everybody's sure what I can do about ISIL. Okay. I'm over here, they're over there, I can... But you could get there if you really wanted to. Jesus and Paul didn't do anything directly about slavery. No. Because their, their existence would have been terminated if they'd done that. Mm -hmm. Well, plus and it wouldn't make sense that because that's the economic system that's back right. then. That brings us back to our own communities. There's a lot of things all of us could do. You realize it at times. And you used an illustration a couple of minutes ago about <clears throat> there was some injustice or something that somebody was asking Jesus about. And 
he was saying, that's not my job right now. My job is to do this right now. Mm -hmm. so, 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 let, so let me ask a question about that, and, and we're going to talk about that in some future lessons, but let me just plant this question in your minds, and then we have to talk about James 4.17 before we finish up here. The question is this. Is the fastest way to deal with injustice out there in the law courts or maybe, you know, parading in the streets with signs or whatever? Or is the fastest way to deal with injustice work for the second coming to happen? The latter. Well, it may all be kind of the same thing depending on your circumstance. But I think the only time when, when real justice is going to be done is after Jesus arrives back here. And if that's the case, then the faster we can make that happen, the better off it'll be. Well, look, at, we've got to go to James 4.17. We can't, we can't overlook this. So then, those who do not do the good they know they should do are guilty of sin. Wow. Couldn't we, each one of us, sit down here and make a list, of maybe hundreds of things, good things that we could do if we had the time and the money and... Well, I think what happens is when you do what you're supposed to do near, God can begin to amplify that and you can find yourself over there mm -hmm. battling ISIL. Okay. Well, and, and, and God is not... It's interesting that Jesus dealt with this in several places. And, and there in, in John 4, when the lady came and met him at the well and so forth, and when, when she came back with the crowds from town, Jesus didn't even stop to eat. The disciples brought all the food, and they said, okay, okay, here we are. Let's, let's, you know, have the prayer. Let's eat. And Jesus said, I have something to eat that you don't know of. What was his bread on that occasion? In the will of God. He was so excited about the possibility of telling the truth, of spreading the gospel to people who wanted to hear it. Think about that. He said, skip the meal. I have other things I'd rather do right now. Think about that. How many of us would do that at that point in time? Um, we, we're, we're out of time anyway, but Christians need to understand, every one of us needs to understand that even Jesus needed time for rest. That will, that's a characteristic of all of us. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these lessons, these lessons that are prepared from Scripture and the efforts of a lot of people to try to do their best to help us to understand our Bibles. Thank you for our discussion together and may it lead others closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.